welcome to the postseason edition or the NIT edition of the Bobby Kremen Show. I'm Nate Ross, your host, of course, along with the head coach of the College of Charleston Cougars, Bobby Kremens. Coach, we sat here last week and you talked about how your team and you and the fans were very disappointed in the fact that you weren't yeah. in the NCAA tournament. But in less than 48 hours, this building sold out. The Dayton Flyers came in here. And it was an amazing atmosphere. I know you've been in some great atmospheres. I've coached in some and I've announced in some great atmospheres. This had to be top three. This place was electric. Yeah, it really was, Nate. Uh, let's recap a couple of things. Um, first of all, as you, as you alluded to, um, it was a very disappointing uh, uh, loss in the championship game of the SOCON championship in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, we had a fight for our lives in the semifinals against Furman. And down the stretch, Wofford executed their half-court offense beautifully. And they got the ball to Dahlman. And you're right, Nate, it was a tough bus ride home. Now, how did we get to the NIT? <laughs> and uh, the reason we got to the NIT was uh, we won the regular season uh, championship. Uh, Wofford and us had the same record, but we had defeated Wofford twice. And that's what gave us a championship. And whoever gets a championship gets the automatic bid to the NIT. And this, this year, Nate, um, we have 32 teams in the NIT. And there were 13 automatic bids, like College of Charleston. Teams that won their regular season, yeah, a lot. but went into their conference tournament and lost. Now, there were several other teams that went into their conference tournament after winning the regular season and lost, but they got an at-large NCAA bid. And a good example of, of somebody like that, George Mason, right. uh, got a, an at-large bid. So um, when there were 13 NIT bids, that meant there were only 19 at-large bids left. So we were really excited to get an, an, an NIT automatic bid. Now we got some other breaks. Um, they put us in a bracket that had the University of Dayton, right. a team that almost got an automatic bid in their conference tournament. In the quarterfinals, they upset uh, top 20 team in Savior. They beat St. Joe's in the semifinals before losing to Richmond in the finals. So that meant Richmond got the automatic bid. Along with um, at-large bids in that league, uh, Temple got an at-large bid, and of course, Savior. Right. So Dayton gets an uh, NIT bid, but, um, the first and second round of NCAA play is at Dayton's home court. So Dayton could not play the home game at their home court, even though they were a higher seed than the College of Charleston, which meant the game had to come to Charleston. Day Dayton, after playing four games, got home on Sunday night. They had to pack up Monday and come to Charleston. They had a lot of traveling. In 48 hours, uh, we sold out this building. Unbelievable. And Nate, for me personally, when I walked out on the court, it was a, a great feeling to see this type of atmosphere. It was electric, and, you're, and you were facing, and you, you didn't mention, the defending NIT champions in the Dayton Flyers and a very athletic basketball team. It was, Nate. Uh, they are very athletic. In the first half, Nate, um, our big guys, um, uh, Trent Wiedemann and uh, Willis Hall, got off to a great star, start. <clears throat> Our star player, Drew Godlock, they were defending him, Nate. He, he missed his first five shots. Uh, what were you thinking? Uh, well, I knew he was going to eventually hit one. Uh, you know, the game was on ESPN2 uh, yep. national TV. Uh, we had their A-team, Jimmy Dykes, Brad Nestle here. Afterwards, when I listened to them, they said, well, Godlock's supposed to be a great shooter. <laughs> Little did they know he was going to wind up with 39 points. But um, Donovan Monroe was hot. And Antoine Miggins, Wiggins made some great drives to the basket. And finally, finally, Drew got going. Uh, he made a couple of threes. Trent Wiedemann got a great rebound, threw it out. Nate, it was a close first half. And then right before the half, we got a little breathing room because Godlock got hot. And then Donovan. Um, um, Dayton had a call. Uh, uh, Three or four timeout, yeah. Nate. Um, Brian Gregory, a great, enthusiastic young coach, uh, called a lot of timeouts. And they, going into the second half, we knew they would fight back. And sure enough, they did. But we had that 
halftime lead that we really needed. And going into the second half, uh, it, we really got after each other. Um, Donovan made some big shots. Um, Drew Godlock continued to play well. Uh, we got fouled down the stretch. Trent Wiedemann. It was 9 uh, for 12 from the line. He got banged a lot. Yeah, and, and we needed those free throws. And, Nate, we're going to go on for a, a great um, a first round NIT victory. Uh, I, and, I, and I have to give a lot of credit to our fans. They made a difference. I can't say enough about the class of Dayton. They're an outstanding team. Uh, they have an outstanding coach. And I knew they were tired, Nate. I knew they were tired. I knew the one advantage we had besides having the game at home was we should have had fresher legs than Dayton had. And we tried to capitalize on that. Well, let's talk about, you talked about their great athleticism. Any young man that I heard Mark Byan can tell your team is a pro prospect, number 33, Chris Wright. He had 21 and 13. <clears throat> he played way above the rim. I asked Trent Wiedemann, have you ever played against somebody that athletic? He said, Nate, I don't think I've seen anybody that, that <laughs> athletic. Unbelievable athlete, among many of them, but Chris Wright's special. He really is, and we knew that going into the game. And, Nate, we were keen on him. Uh, when the ball went to him, uh, we had a help down. And uh, we wanted to make him kick it out. And if they were going to beat us, they're going to beat us from the outside. Uh, my staff, as always, they do a great scouting job. But uh, we needed to help him. Uh, we talked about, you know, Dami getting the ball late in the Wofford game right. against Trent. And we, you know, we couldn't help Trent as much in the Wofford game because of their outside shooting. Uh, but, you know, you have to dig down. We dig down in Wofford, and they burned us with a three. So uh, in this particular game, we did the same thing, and fortunately for us, uh, they did not make threes. Well, you talk about Drew had 39, which sets a Division I scoring record. He broke uh, Dante Draper's 38. Donovan had 23. Trent, 15 and 6. But the thing that impresses me is you shoot 54%, you hold them, and you shoot 79% from the line, and you hold them to 43%. You only foul them 17 times yeah. playing great defense without fouling. That's a big key to any game. Yeah, but again, they, you know, the bottom line was the atmosphere. Oh, it was unbelievable. Um, that's, that's what, you know, it gave us high energy uh, when we walked on the court. Dayton plays hard. Um, as you mentioned, they were the defending champion. They just, what an incredible week they had. Um, beating Savior in the quarterfinals. Yep. Um, and, and then almost beating Richmond in the finals. And... And they came in here, uh, they're a class outfit. And um, they played very hard. And, but, you know, they were, they were coming into a tough atmosphere. And I'm so proud of our city, our school, and, and how they responded to this game. You know, a lot of times the, the crowd inspires people on offense, but this was a pretty intelligent crowd tonight. They got you going on the defensive end when they knew you needed a stop. Oh, completely. It was, the, the crowd in here was amazing tonight. I've never been a part of anything this loud and this special. And I think that was, honestly the best crowd we've had all year which is crazy considering how much time they had and notice i heard coach byington in the locker room talk about they're really athletic up front they were really athletic up front yeah they were um i was on the wrong end of a couple athletic plays <laughs> um i don't think we played a team that athletic this year they were it was surprising how athletic they were they you got the ball inside a couple times it got pounded each time didn't score but made free throws but you guys just hung in there this crowd had to inspire you on both ends oh yeah the crowd was nuts i've never heard it this loud in here we could barely like hear, hear each other talking on the court um so yeah like coach Byington said it was a last minute thing and how many people were there it was crazy yeah in 48 hours they sold this place out now you didn't have 39 but mr Goudlock did it's got to be fun watching somebody do that yeah, it is, especially when they start cutting into the lead and then he makes shots like he did. It's, it's frustrating for the other team. You can, you can see them getting down because, you know, they can't really guard them. A great performance by your basketball team inspired by this empty arena now filled to the rafters. The students came out. The city came out. And it was a proud victory for the College of Charleston Cougars. Our AT&T Player of the Week is really our AT&T Player of the Week, Andrew Goudlock. He missed a couple shots early, and then he made four threes in a row to reach some serious milestones in the basketball game. 62 players have reached 2,500 points in Division I basketball. He is number 62. He had 39 points on the night. That breaks Dante Draper's Division I record for the College of Charleston. Of course, Dante had 38. Andrew Goudlock had 39. So our AT&T Player of the Week is Andrew Goudlock with a great win for the College of Charleston in round one of the NIT, round two's coming up.
And now the purple dusk of twilight time Steals across the meadows of my heart Once upon a time, there were three bears who lived together in a house of their own in a wood. In the network, no matter where you are, you're never far. AT&T. Rethink possible. Welcome back once again to the Bobby Kremen Show, postseason edition. Of course, we're joined by all-time leading scorer, player of the year in the Southern Conference, Andrew Goudlock. And uh, we'll talk about those kind of accolades in a minute. But what kind of pressure, coming into the year, preseason player of the year, you end up player of the year, thank goodness. You break the all-time scoring record. Mentally, did that wear on you, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, it could. You could have, it'll take an effect on you if you let it. I mean... A lot of things that we go through with the season with uh, Coach bringing in mental toughness guys and just Coach himself knowing and been around the game so long that he knows the mental aspect of it. And once you let that mental aspect get involved, I mean, it kind of takes away from the fun of the game and you're kind of thinking about things too much. So I just see every every opportunity as just another another place for me to show what I can do on the basketball court. You know, I try to play with a chip on my shoulder all the time and you know, that motivation kind of leads me. Well, I know... You could give a darn, and we won't say the other word about individual <laughs> awards. All you care about is winning, and that's great, and that's one of your great attributes. But breaking the all-time scoring record of Gus Gustafson, whose banner's hanging up in the rafters here, was it nice to get that off your back and get it over with? Yeah, I mean, people kept talking about it. You know, I walking down the street, everybody was stopping me, asking me about it. Oh, you gonna break tonight? You gonna do this? And it was a, uh, it felt like a lot of tension building up to that point. So I wanted to just get it over with. Uh, it was a great accomplishment for myself as well as my teammates. Um, you know, my family came down, which made a very emotional moment for me. And it was uh, it was good to just get that monkey off my back and, you know, be able to keep playing in the game and not make the game all about that moment. Let's go back a little bit. Four years ago, Antoine Wiggins, Jeremy Simmons, Donovan Monroe, and you all start together. Mm -hmm. You had dreams. You had goals. Were your, were your goals to be the all-time scoring record? No. Nah. Be player of the year, that kind of stuff? I know. What were the goals when you guys started as freshmen? Our goals were just, you know, once – we get older and older it's just to dominate as much as we could. I mean, we felt like when we came in, we had a lot more talent than people maybe may have given us credit for. You know, a lot of people didn't know who we were. Sure. And rightfully so, we didn't get much credit because we hadn't done anything. But, you know, just playing amongst each other and being around each other and getting to know each other a lot, we kind of saw what, you know, each person was potentially going to be able to do in the future. And it was, uh, you know, we used to just have those talks when we were freshmen about, you know, when we became seniors and, you know, what we're going to do in the later years of our college careers. And uh, thankfully, we all got great opportunities to, to maximize our potential. Last year, Antoine gets hurt. This year, Jeremy gets hurt. It's kind of Batman and Robin, you and Donovan. Yeah. Did you guys talk about that? Like, now it's our, it's our job. There's only two of us left. Obviously, Antoine's back, but Jeremy um, yeah. gets hurt with about 15 games to go. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely surreal uh, for Antoine and Jeremy. Um, you know, I wouldn't... It's some, one of those things that you never think will happen, sure. you know, and then when they come and tell you, you kind of just have this dumbfounded look on your face because you don't know what to expect. And Donovan and I did get together and we talked about it and, um, you know, we, we, we got a clear understanding that we have to step our games up a little bit more, you know, for the team because, you know, Jeremy and Antoine are sure. such big parts of the team. So, um, yeah, we, we, we came together and we just tried to do what we could to fill those gaps. We're going to talk about the Southern Conference Tournament in a minute, but let me go back to last year. In this building, mm -hmm. as you walk in the locker room, and if people haven't been in the locker room, you don't get this advantage. There's a huge picture on the wall yeah. of this gentleman making a shot over the North Carolina player to put it in overtime, and, of course, you win the game. You walk by the picture every day. Mm -hmm. How many times do you really look at it? I mean, it's going to be there a long time. They're not taking it down when the season's over. I mean, I look at it, I mean, more than you probably think. I mean, just... When you come in the locker room, that's like the first thing you see when you're walking down the little hallway. And it's just a, uh, I mean, it's a great picture. I was surprised when I first saw it. I mean, I was speechless. Uh, you know, my parents saw that. They were the same way. It was just a, uh, another special night for, for our team. And for them to put that on the wall, you know, as commemoration for us was a great thing. Sure. And I look at it a lot just to, you know, remind me of the things that I've been through and some of the things that we've accomplished at this school. And at North Carolina night, that was just a, uh, probably one of the greatest moments I've been a part of in my life. 
You've been in a lot of situations like that where maybe it's not the shot of the game, but it's a big shot in the game. Mm -hmm. All the things Coach Kremens talks to you, your fellow teammates talk to you, does that help you get through something like that? Because you made a ton of them. Yeah, I mean, they just, they have the ultimate confidence in me. You know, it just allows me to have the confidence in myself to just keep taking those shots. I mean, those are the shots that they want me to take. And, you know, you, you got to do what the team needs. So, um, you know, I pride myself in taking those kinds of shots. And Coach Kremen says the person that takes those, those shots always has courage and he's always strong. You got to be strong to do those types of things. And, you know, I just try to be that person for the team. Um, you, know, you never know what's going to happen in those situations, but you just try to live with what goes on and just try to do what you can. As a former coach, you're absolutely right. And Coach Kremen said it when I was sitting next to him on the bench at Upstate. It takes a lot of courage to take those shots. Forget making them. It takes courage just to take them. Mm -hmm. and then when you take them and make them, that's big. Speaking of taking and making, let me go back a couple weeks. Have you ever been a part of a better comeback than in the semifinals against Furman? With you uh -huh. and, now, you and Donovan out there, as we said, mm -hmm. there was a lot of talking going on because I was sitting there right at courtside. That was an amazing comeback. What did that feel like when it started going? I mean, it was kind of, that was like a speechless moment for us. That right, that was probably better than the Temple game when we were freshmen and we were down like 20-something. I mean, that was just the, how hard we fought for that game. All the passion that went to that game was just, uh, it was just the epitome of our team. I mean, it just showed how we, we do things. I mean, it just showed how much fight we had because two or three years ago, probably even last year, we wouldn't have won that type of game. And um, you know, it just showed how far we've come. You know, we, we stayed with the game. We didn't just start chucking up threes. And we actually played defense, started rebounding, and helping out those younger guys, and it just showed how far we've come. I mean, it was it was uh, after the game I was even speechless because I didn't honestly I didn't know how we had done it because it wasn't like we were making a bunch of shots, it wasn't like we put on an unbelievable offensive explosion, which which people are used to us doing. It was just a, a grinded out type of game, and uh, you know, luckily we got through it. In fact, at the press conference you talked about, I don't know what to say. It was just a great win. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for your four years. It's been a pleasure watching you. I'm sure we're going to watch you get paid to play this game next year. I hope so. And uh, thanks a lot for your efforts. And everybody in the College of Charleston will thank you as well. We'll be back with a lot more of the Bobby Kremen Show right after this. Thank you. Welcome back once again to the Bobby Kremen Show. And this is the portion of the show where we take a look at next week's opponent and a look around the NCAA, which is brought to you by our great friends, at Piggly Wiggly. Coach, before we get into the uh, the Vikings, which you're going to play next of Cleveland State, let's talk about the field in general, the yeah. NIT. Well, Nate, uh, first of all, we all know about the NIT. Um, the final uh, two games are at the Mecca of College Basketball in yeah. Madison Square Garden. In order to get to New York, you have to win three games. Now, Nate, there's always controversy um, with the, um, with the, the, the top seeds uh, because most of the time, all the top seeds in the NIT are teams that felt like they should be in the big sure. dance. And um, it's no different this year. You have the St. Mary's, uh, the Colorado, the Alabama. I thought for sure yep. Alabama was in. Virginia Tech, it, it, it just seemed like um, a couple weeks ago where they defeated the number one team in the country, the Duke Blue Devils, and poor Seth Greenberg um, back on the bubble and just missed getting out. And they, these are really good basketball Wichita teams. Wichita State. Wichita State. Well, I don't think they were going to get in. Uh, um, close. They were close. Missouri State. Yep. Who so, they fought with for the regular yeah. season championship. Nate, I would love to see the winner of the NIT get an automatic bid the following year. And everybody says, well, what if they stink the following year? We'll give them the last bid. It's a great idea. Um, so the, we have some great teams in the NIT. Really incredible competitive field. Uh, there were some upsets in the first round. St. Mary's got upset by Kent State, a number two seed. And Kent State went out to St. Mary's. And St. Mary's probably disappointed about not getting in the big dance yep. and did not come into it with their whole heart. And that's when you get knocked off. I've been in that position as a coach when I was at Georgia Tech when we missed out on the NCAA. And we did not play well in the NCAA. But we got to concentrate on our bracket. Uh, we now, after getting the lucky break of getting a home game, we now go back on the road to a higher seed. Um, Gary Walters, uh, yep. former coach of Rutgers, a great guy. He has some great guards. And this young man, Cole, um, he's considered one of the finest guards in the country. There'll be a ton of NC, uh, uh, NBA scouts watching both him and Drew Godlock. They have a great perimeter team. They got off to a 12-0 start. Uh, the winner of this game is in the bracket 
plays the winner of the um, Virginia Tech Wichita State game, which is uh, should be a great game. That game will be at Virginia Tech. You can't look forward. You got to stay in the present. Um, so we're, it should be a great game. We got to play well, Nate. Uh, we have not played well on the road before we went into the SoCon tournament, and we got to play smart. And we got to guard Cole, and we got to guard these other guys. They can run. Cole is tremendous in transition. And so, Nate, we, we, we got to contain him somehow, some way. They got to contain Drew Godlock. Uh, it's Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock. I know we'll, we'll be all around uh, the NCAA tournament. They actually have a, a region site in Cleveland. Uh, but they'll be playing on um, Friday and Sunday. To Quick and Loan Arena where the so, Cavaliers play. So a lot right? of basketball going around. And, Nate, I really hope we can respond and, and play a great game in Cleveland. Well, the Cougars play Cleveland State, 2 o'clock ESPNU on Saturday. It should be a great round two of the NIT, two guard-oriented teams, and we'll see who comes out on top and hopefully advances to the next round, as Coach just alluded to. We'll be back to close out this week's Bobby Kremen show right after these messages. Welcome back once again to the Bobby Kremen Show. We talked about the who, the when, and the where. Let me tell you about that now. The who is Cleveland State. That's who the Cougars will play in round two of the NIT. Who, in fact, beat the Vermont Catamounts, who came right in here in Bracket Busters. Um, the when is Saturday at 2 o'clock on ESPNU. And we talked about the where, and that's at Cleveland State. If you were here for the Dayton game, you had an amazing experience. If you're going to Cleveland State, we hope you'll have an even better experience on the road for the Cougars. We're going to follow the Cougars as long as the season lasts, and we hope we will see you next week after a win right here on The Bobby Kremen Show.